welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. I hope some of you had a chance to visit the pumpkin patch, because that's where I've been the last month. Um, and if you, do, if you didn't today, it'll be out there until the 31st, so you will have time to. Um, I hope you're enjoying all the yummy food. There's, there's even pumpkin pie over there that's not already gone. Um, just a few things before we get started tonight. Um, if you were here last month, I gave out some of these little cards. There was cards for the restaurants. Uh, so when you go to eat at a restaurant, you can hand the waiter one of these cards and it will tell them what foods you can have and what foods you're eating. And um, if you did not get some, please let me know because I brought, I brought them again tonight so that you can visit. I want everyone to have them so whenever they go out traveling, they can um, eat healthy. Um, and also something that um, I've noticed that some of you bring your own plates and cuts and forks and spoons and every night, which is perfectly wonderful of you, and, and that's better for the environment. So if you want to do that, feel free to do so. Um, it, but don't worry about it either, because Dennis and I will continue to provide utensils for you and, and plates and stuff. So whatever you want to do, we're, we're happy with that. And so all of that being said, um, I'm excited and very proud to introduce our speaker tonight. This is Dr. Irvin Sani. Um, we all owe him a lot because almost six years ago he treated my broken arm and told me to read the China study and he changed my life and in turn I'm trying to change all of yours. Um, he's, he's a wonderful man, he's a brilliant doctor and he's our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Irvin Sani. Well, good evening. It's good, to, it's good to be here. So how many people here uh, have been here before and have already taken on the, the vegan or the whole food plant-based lifestyle? Just out of curiosity, raise your hand. And how many people? I've been here before, but I haven't taken Okay, okay, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that, for sure. Um, and then how many people have never been to one of these meetings at your first time? Okay, how many people are not at all familiar with, uh, I guess, the term vegan or the term whole food plant-based lifestyle or have very little information, very little experience with that? Okay, good. All right, well, I was just curious kind of what the, who the audience was and if uh, we get to a point where I'm sharing information that everyone's very familiar with, maybe we'll shift gears and I'll just start doing some some question and answers. Um, I didn't make any slides, sorry. I didn't have any time. Maybe if I do another one, uh, next time I'll kind of figure out what it is you guys are interested in and we can talk about what it is that you're interested in. But what I wanted to talk about, because I think it affects me, I think it affects uh, all of you, it affects everyone, and that's the obstacles to leading a vegan or a whole food plant-based uh, lifestyle, or really being healthy, period, in this day and age. Uh, it's, in my opinion, very difficult and there's a lot of obstacles. Uh, a little bit about myself, I am an orthopedic surgeon. You're thinking, why in the world is an orthopedic surgeon sp speaking about nutrition? No, I'm not a nutritionist, uh, I'm not a, uh, that isn't my education. In fact, it's no doctor's education. You've, if, it, if you've been to one of these before, you've already heard that, uh, and this is our first obstacle, is the education of our physicians is, uh, in terms of nutrition in medical school, is non-existent, literally non-existent. Uh, I think we spent a few hours on nutrition and what they considered nutrition, and I went to Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, arguably the best, I like to believe, and many people believe is the best medical school in Texas and one of the best in the country. Uh, maybe that's uh, my opinion, but it's definitely a, a fantastic school, the largest medical center on the planet, and so we have lots of uh, experience. We got to see lots of things and do lots of things. And uh, we had phenomenal professors to teach us basic science. But our uh, nutrition course study was about two or three hours. And they said, this is a vitamin C molecule. This is a vitamin D molecule. Here's how it's metabolized. So, you know, uh, I would argue that that's not nutrition. And it certainly is a practical nutrition. And I think that's really what's key is practical, uh, is what's, what's practical, what's usable, what's understandable, what's something that you can actually implement. So that's one of the obstacles. <clears throat> I grew up um, single mom, 
uh, you know, certainly not wealthy. I don't, know, I don't know if we were poor, but I'd say by, some, by a lot of people's standards, we're real close, lower middle class. Uh, mom had at one point, you know, more than one job. And, you know, I grew up eating a lot of, you know, McDonald's and Wendy's and, you know, that kind of stuff. Mom didn't know any better. If she did, I don't know if she would have had time because she was struggling just to make ends meet. Um, you know, we, we were, you know, she's, we're living essentially paycheck to paycheck. And, and that's tough. I mean, you, you don't, if you don't, it's one thing to say someone doesn't have the resources. Some people are just stressed. I mean, even if you make, if you have a good living, sometimes you work so many hours that you just don't have the time to really, um, to, to do the shopping, growing your own food, uh, figuring out what on the menu is healthy, and getting the education. That's the key here. I think the biggest obstacle is lack of education. And there's a lot of people in the, in the world, in the country, that would like you not to know this information. They would much rather that, that you continue to eat their McDonald's and their steak and their Snickers bars and get diabetes and high blood pressure and kidney failure and then go on to require uh, lots of medications, which by the way, about half the medications people take are to treat the side effects of the first half the medications. So if you, I see old people all the time, or even younger people that are on 20 medications, and 10 of those medications are to treat the side effects of the first 10. So I would argue, let's try not to get on those medications if we, you know, and I'm not gonna tell you don't take blood pressure medication. I'm not gonna tell you not to take your diabetes medication. But I'm also gonna tell you, don't just take the pills and say to yourself, I'm done. This is all I have to do. I'm just gonna take these pills and I'm just gonna keep eating my uh, garbage food or, or not exercising or smoking or drinking or whatever it is that you're doing not to take care of yourself because I've got my pills. The key would be to do what you can to get off that medication if possible. If you can't, you can't, okay? There's gonna be times when medication is important. We should be very glad that, that, the, that, the, re, that the research, most of the world's research comes through the US pharmaceutical companies and we have absolutely come up with life-saving life -saving medications in this country. Unfortunately, the way that they're pushed on us uh, is inappropriate and especially when uh, doctors are much more likely just to say take a pill than to even talk to you about nutrition. I mean, who in here has really had a long, meaningful, discussion about what to eat with their medical doctor. I realize that chiropractors sometimes are more into that, but you know, how many people have been to the doctor quite a bit and have maybe spent, they, they'll say something like, you need to lose weight. You need to eat better. It's like saying, invent, invent a spaceship, you know? So yeah, come and let me know when you, how it comes along when you invent a spaceship. Has anyone had that experience where your doctor really doesn't talk to you much about nutrition at all? In fact, a lot of doctors don't even believe nutrition is important, that it's even uh, much of a factor. That's a big obstacle because doctors are respected. They're considered to be the experts. And so if the person who you're relying on to provide you with health, number one, didn't get any education in medical school. Again, not practical. I'm not saying doctors don't know what vitamin D is, but knowing what a vitamin D molecule is is not education and nutrition. But they're also not spending the time. And also another obstacle is the way that doctors are paid. So if I... There's there, and I'll just go through this very quickly. I hadn't planned on talking about this, but I think it's relevant, it's interesting. So the, we'll use Medicare for an example. Medicare, the most common um, code that a doctor uses, the way, that, the way we get paid is through what's called E&M, Evaluation and Management Codes. And the most common code is a 99213 and a 99214. So I believe Medicare, actually my office manager's here, she can correct me if I'm wrong, Medicare pays about 40 bucks for a 99213 and maybe $100 for a 99214. So what does that matter? Well, the way I can get myself up to a 99214 is by spending 45 minutes talking to the patient. If I sit there and talk to you for 45 minutes and talk to you about broccoli and kale and you know, the, the changes you need to make in your diet, I make an extra 60 bucks. Or I can put you on a new medication, I can change your medication, I can sign you up for procedure, I can sign you up for a surgery, I can order a test, and if I do any of those things, even if it only takes me three seconds to do them, I still get that same 60 bucks. What do you think is gonna happen? If I, honestly, if I sat around doing the 45 minute thing, I'd go broke. I wouldn't be able to afford the overhead in my office. So the way the government and the way the system works is literally designed so that we will push more pills, do more procedures, and, and that's not necessarily what's in your best interest. It's just, it's just simply not. And unfortunately, what you have to do as the individual is take personal responsibility and take your health in your own hands. 
And that's a lot of times, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've learned about nutrition has been through people like Vicky, you know, people who are out in the trenches, so to speak, the soldiers, if you will, uh, because I don't learn it from my doctor friends. My doctor friends and I don't even talk about this. My doctor friends, a lot of them think I'm crazy because I lost a bunch of weight juicing and, you know, I've gone through, you know, this is a, this is a, a life's experiment, you know, and that's the other thing I would tell you. And I went to Baylor undergraduate as well. And when I was very young, uh, I was very plugged into the church. I still am uh, to some degree, but I was very black and white. I remember when I was a freshman at Baylor, I was very upset. I was very black and white about religion. I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't mature. And so if someone wasn't absolutely following Jesus the way I perceived that he should be followed, there was no other way. It's either you're, you're a Christian or you're not. And, and, and as we know, if everyone had to be a perfect Christian in order to be a Christian or whatever your religion is, no one would be a Christian. It's impossible. We're, all, we're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to sin. Same thing with diet. If you think that, if you're in your mind, if I don't have a perfect diet, if I don't follow this to the T, I might as well not do it at all. Well, that's crazy. Uh, um, it's impossible to have a perfect diet. You're going to eat some bad food. You're going to want some meat every once in a while. If you don't, fine. I mean, if you can follow it uh, that closely, that's fantastic. But I'd much rather see one, someone smoke 15 cigarettes, go from 20 cigarettes a week, or a day, I'm sorry, to 15 cigarettes. I mean, sure, they haven't quit smoking, but they've certainly made a huge improvement. I mean, hell, one, one cigarette less a day would be better than, than nothing. And so any changes you make, even if you go from eating meat three times a day or eating Snickers or Coca-Cola or whatever it is, you know, a lot to chopping that in half or chopping it down by any percentage, 10%, 20%, 30%, you've made an improvement you know, in your diet. Don't feel like you got to be perfect or right? it's just not worth doing. So a lot of it is upbringing. A lot of it is what we, what we do as children, what we're given as children, um, what we're taught by our parents as children. And when you take your kids to McDonald's or you give them junky food, you're teaching them something. You're teaching them something psychologically and you're teaching them something physiologically. Their bodies are literally learning to process that food. And that's why people can have a psychological and physiological quote unquote dependence and therefore go with, through withdrawal when they stop eating the junk. I ate junk a, a big portion of my life. And when I was stressed out in medical school, or I was stressed out in my practice when I first got to Seguin, um, I was 50 pounds heavier, 55 pounds heavier than I am now. I act actually inadvertently became a vegan. I really didn't really think about that much. Well, I wanted to juice and I didn't really think putting either a raw or cooked piece of meat in my blender sounded very good. And so the things that went in my blender happened to be kale and fruit and maybe some protein powder. So I guess there was some animal protein. But, um, I, but, I, but I remember a big part of that, I was only doing fruits and vegetables, and mainly vegetables, mainly grains. And, uh, and I was juicing. And, uh, and, and it was a very effective way to lose weight. Um, but anyway, the point is that um, we're, we're handicapped by what we're taught as children. So it's important, I think, you say, oh, God, can't kids, you know, we have a joke in orthopedics, you know, you, you can cut a kid's arm off they're like a salamander and it'll grow back. That's not true, so don't cut your kid's arm off. But the point is that when a kid has a fracture or an injury, it's amazing how they heal. And so people think, oh, you can feed kids anything and, and they'll be fine. I and mean, that's probably true to some degree. They really are very resilient. Their immune systems and their bodies can, can really handle the damage, but you're teaching them things, you're teaching them habits, and you're also showing them as their authority figure what's okay and not, not what's not okay, whether you realize it or not. And uh, that has a lifelong effect. There's studies now that show um, that two-thirds of children in this country would be morbidly obese by the year 2020. We're on track for that. And if that happens, we're going to have a healthcare crisis that can't be fixed by any amount of money, any amount of medication, any amount of doctors. There's also a study that shows that children who end up being heavy when they're young tend to be heavier when they're older, okay? And so by feeding your kids better food, you can say, oh, so what if they're a little chubby or I gave them you know, some bad food? They can go vegan when they're 25. It's a lot harder for them. It's a lot harder. It takes a lot more effort. It takes a lot more um, energy conviction, uh, whatever it, they're, whatever. The, you mind if I move these cards right over here? They kind of, kind of keep looking at them. Um, and so, and so um, it's really important that we serve as role models in lots of ways, including uh, the way we eat, the food we eat, and even the way we treat the planet through the food that we eat. Elliot Aronson was a social psychologist. He wrote a book called The Social Animal. Uh, and it's a very interesting book. It's used as a, as a uh, 
textbook in places like Rice and other big, uh, Rice University in Houston, other big uh, universities. And Elliot Anderson wrote this book, and he had, it's a very interesting book, even if you weren't a social psychologist, which I'm not. But he had a chapter on conformity. And they literally were able to show that through meticulous scientific studies, one, he had a, he had a handful, but I'll, I'll give you an example of one. That basically, you're, but my point is that you're affected by the people around you. That's what you know, conformity is. Conformity means everybody around you is doing something, and so you feel compelled to do it as well. And they had these, I think they were college students, they might have been adults. They weren't super young or super old. And they had a line on a piece of paper. They had a number of lines drawn on a piece of paper. And one of the lines was clearly, it wasn't real obvious, but it was sort of questionable. You could tell if you looked at it, you'd say, yeah, that's the longest line. And they'd ask the people, which one's the longest line on the paper? And if the person, the subject, so they have a room full of actors, and there would be one or two subjects, and, the, and the basically, if the subject went first, they would usually pick the correct line. But if the subject went last, and they, let, and they had the actors pick the wrong line on purpose, by the time they got to them, they thought, God, these six people in front of me chose line B, and I'm pretty sure it's line A, but I guess it must be line B, you know? Because they were affected by conformity. It was shown very clearly, it's the same reason that the Nazis were able to get away with what they were able to get away with. But the point is that conformity, you know, you guys are probably not conformists, or some of you aren't, or at least you're curious and you're open-minded and don't necessarily take your marching orders from the actions of others. But the point is that conformity, your children are conforming to your beliefs. You're conforming to the beliefs around you. That's another obstacle to leading a healthy lifestyle is that when people around you, if someone in your, if everyone in your household smokes, imagine how hard it is to quit smoking. You know, you've got that smoke in your face every day. If everyone in your house is a meat eater, it was an obstacle for me. I became a vegan years ago. I was a vegan at the time for about six months. Now, I've never gone back to eating meat three times a day. So I would say I've been a partial vegan, uh, so to speak, uh, and gone from eating meat, you know, very frequently to now, now I'll eat meat. I, I still eat meat every once in a while. But it's once a month, twice a month, and sometimes even longer uh, than that I've gone without meat. And I'm striving to go um, you know, even longer, but I'll still have meat on occasion, some transparency here on the truth. Um, I call it a whole food plant-based lifestyle. Uh, vegan to me is not a useful word. Uh, well, sure it is, but for me I like to expand on that a little bit. You can eat french fries and drink beer and be a vegan. Okay? We all would agree that that's not healthy. So, and I, I like to say whole food plant-based because we talk about eating food that you can recognize as food, something that grew out of the ground, not something that's been ground up into powder and put into a bag with chemicals that preserve it for 30 years, you know, hamburger helper or whatever. So that's, that's not healthy, that's processed food, which is just as bad as meat, probably in some cases worse. But a whole food plant-based diet, which you're basing your, you're basing your um, diet on whole foods, plant-based, based. Based means that's mainly what you eat. And maybe it's, if, that's, if you can do whole food, plant-based, nothing but, fantastic. And, I, and that's what we should all strive for. But don't feel like because you ate meat one time, oh, I've blown it. I'm not a vegan anymore. I might as well just quit and head over to McDonald's and get a Big Mac and supersize it with fries and a, and a drink. No, I mean, it's okay to make mistakes. Just like when you're a Christian, it's okay to, to make a sin. You, just, you ask for forgiveness and... and and I guess in the world of food, you know, you, you're, you're obviously forgiven. You forgive yourself and you just move on and you try to be as healthy as you uh, possibly can. Another huge obstacle is the lack of availability of good choices. So some places are worse than others. I'm not trying to be mean to Seguin, but there's not a lot of, you know, if you want to eat a whole food plant-based diet, you're in trouble, okay? Uh, believe me, I've tried, I've gone to a lot of restaurants and tried it here and I end up eating the house salad or something, uh, you know, most of the time, which quite frankly isn't a very healthy salad anyway, because it's, it's usually iceberg lettuce, which doesn't have a whole lot of nutritional value. You go to Austin, then you're going to have a whole lot more uh, choices there. Um, so the, the, the result is you end up cooking for yourself. And I think that that leads to the other obstacle, which is lack of education. And when you start cooking for yourself, you start learning how to cook, you learn what's in food, you get engaged. The only way you're really gonna to be successful at this, and not just being a vegan, but being healthy in general, is to take some uh, personal stock in being healthy. You can't just rely on your doctor to tell you, here, take this, you just do this and you'll be fine. You're gonna have to do your research, you're gonna find out that what you're doing isn't right, things are gonna change. We're gonna find out that the supplement we thought was the greatest thing five or 10 years from now isn't. It's okay, that's how science works. We also find out that thalidomide 
cause birth defects in children. We found out that DDT was a toxic poison. One of the, you know, we, they had doctors advertising cigarettes in the 50s saying smoking cigarettes is, is healthy. Which brings me to my next point is propaganda by large corporations. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna depend on your government to, and I'm not like anti-government, but, but this is just a fact. If you're gonna depend on your government, you're in big trouble because the government isn't gonna protect you. You think, oh well, McDonald's can't be bad because the government would not allow it if it was bad. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. And there's a lot of bad information about milk and about bananas being a good source of potassium. Uh, there's much better sources of calcium than milk, and there's a lot of problems with milk. There's much better sources of potassium than bananas. But what these corporations have done, oh, there's a little bit of potassium in bananas. Let's make it a big deal to eat your bananas to get your potassium. And they use that to, to make profits because they only have... Uh, they only have a, um, uh, um, the fiduciary responsibility to make sure that their shareholders make more money. That's really, I mean, that's the law. In fact, if they don't make more money for the shareholders, that's the only way they're breaking the law. Lobbyists influence lawmakers. So, you know, unfortunately, um, you're not going to get a straight answer from, from Washington either because the, the corporations, the food corporations, uh, lobby to the senators, to the, to the congressmen, and the, uh, to, to Congress, basically, to the lawmakers. And additionally, there's a revolving door where people who are in Congress are oftentimes the CEO of some big pharmaceutical company or big food company, and, um, and, and they rotate in and out. And so there's not really good, and you know, that's, that's why we have subsidized corn. I mean, I don't know if you, how many people realize that certain foods in this country are subsidized by the government? Your taxpayer dollars pay to poison us. There's no subsidy for organic broccoli that I know of. If anybody knows of a subsidy for organic broccoli, let me know. I'd like to hear about that. But there is a subsidy, and I'm not bagging on the farmers. I don't want somebody, I'm sure everyone here is deeply connected to farmers. My grandma was a farmer. I love farmers. They're not the culprits here. They are simply playing within the system that is created for them by the legislature. But this is a big obstacle because the true cost of making that 99 cent hamburger at, at uh, McDonald's is, a, some people have said, between 35 and $200 when you factor in the real cost, the damage to the environment, the damage to the person's health, you know, global warming if you believe in that, and all those kind of things. So, and, it's, and the only reason that those hamburgers can be sold so incredibly cheaply is because they're subsidized by the government. So if some poor mother, another obstacle, goes into HEB and has a Lone Star card, and she wants to buy food for her kids, She's looking for calories. She's got to feed a family. And she can buy a heck of a lot more Cheetos and Fruit Loops and trash with that Lone Star card than she can a pound or whatever, a unit of organic, bro or organic broccoli. Because the organic broccoli is not subsidized by the US government. Can I have my water, please? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's a lot of obstacles. Let's see, what else do I? These are just ones that I've written down. So these are, I think these are some of the big ones. Um, and, and my point really here is not to depress you, I hope I haven't, but I'm telling you that no one's gonna pop out and say, be healthy. No one's gonna pop out and say, oh, this is good for you, this is bad for you. Well, Vicky might. <laughs> and, and you did. Yeah, and I, and I did. I read a book called The China Study, which is still a very good book, and I think it's even on the table over here. Yeah. There's so many great resources now. And they say, and I read a, a financial report recently, that the next big boon is going to be whole food plant-based eating. Because now the people on Wall Street have gotten the feel that the public wants a change, and they're, of course, going to try to cash in. Fine. Good. I hope they do. I hope they cash in and people really start uh, switching over. You know, but the problem is, I mean, what if I wanted to make a law to outlaw cars or something. I mean, I guess that's kind of what electric cars are. But there's a lot of people, there's a lot of senators, there's a lot of lobbyists, there's a lot of people who their livelihood depends on that. And there's, that isn't going to change very easily because what are those people going to do? What is, what's their new job going to be? And their new job can be, it, we, we've always been able to reinvent ourselves. Look what happened with cigarettes. I mean, those people had to figure something out. The, the cigarette industry fought tooth and nail to, um, to hang on and to continue to poison people. They knew damn well that they were killing people with their product. And the, the food industry has gotten smarter because they've passed laws that make, it's actually a crime if you were to go to a, 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 a feedlot and start taking pictures, they can actually have, throw, you, throw you in jail. I thought there was something called three, freedom of the press, but that's been uh, outlawed. You'd actually go to jail for taking pictures of a feedlot or a Tyson chicken farm and, and putting that uh, online or I don't know, whatever you, whatever you would do with that. So. Um, unfortunately, you're going to have to take uh, personal responsibility 
and, uh, and uh, you know, get educated and just get out there and figure it out. I've gone from juicing. I mean, I've done, I know that if you watch this, a lot of what I'm gonna, a lot of what I took that I haven't talked about yet, <laughs> and maybe we'll have time for it, um, was from Dr. Clapper, and that was the video, and it's a fantastic video. Um, he really is down on, on the ketotic, on ketosis. I disagree with him a little bit, okay? I don't think that ketosis is um, a good long-term plan, okay? It's, a, it's sort of a fad diet, but if someone's really overweight, and it also depends on how you go about the ketosis. He, he might actually agree with me. He doesn't like the paleo diet. He doesn't like pumping your body with um, meat and going into ketosis and eating only meat. When I went into ketosis, I did it only with plants. And so instead of providing more meat to pr for the ketones, for the fuel in my body, I was actually burning my own fat. So I was eating greens in a smoothie, but I was still fasting. I did what's called intermittent fasting, and maybe I'll give a talk on that sometime. And I basically forced myself into a state of ketosis, but there was no outside source of ketones. In other words, I wasn't putting meat into my body. And so what happened is my body ate itself up, and it started, and I lost 50 pounds in 100 days. And Felt great, never got sick, and, and it worked out, um, it worked for me. It doesn't, isn't gonna work for everybody. But what I recommend being uh, ketotic, and uh, definitely no, I think it is hard on your body. And he even said in his thing, I think he puts people in ketosis sometimes for 30 days yeah. or, or something like that. Uh, yeah, but, at True North Health, and Kenneth, right? Ken, yeah, Kenneth and uh, Mouse have been there. And at True North Health, and he works there, they do put people in ketosis, especially if you have a lot of health problems. Yeah. Uh, you know that they will do that. So he does. He doesn't completely disagree with it. He disagrees with the. So there's some evidence. Now I don't want to get too scientific, but there's some evidence of something called the mTOR pathway. And what happens is when you start, okay, you know, and that's a whole other subject. I could probably stay here all night talking. Is starvation. In America, if you don't eat every 10 seconds, you're starving to death. You know, I understand that for a long time, we went for days without meals. We ran around with a spear, running our butts off trying to catch food, and when we didn't, which is most of the time, we ate berries and bark and leaves and things like that. But when, your body, when you go into a state of fasting, and fasting just means you're not eating real frequently, your body turns on a pathway called the mTOR pathway. And it literally starts to take out the trash. So it's gonna start searching for amino acids, it's gonna start searching for the components necessary to continue to build the healthy cells. Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna tear something out, are you gonna tear down the healthy cells, or are you gonna tear down the precancerous cells and the junky cells? You're gonna tear, your body goes after the junky stuff. So it takes out the junk and says, well, I don't have any amino acids to build this new protein I need, so I'm gonna go over here to this old rotten uh, shelf over here, and I'm gonna break that down and use the components from that shelf to build new proteins. I'm not gonna go over to my brand new, you know, car that I just bought. So it, it, it tears up, it literally takes out the trash. And so there's some evidence that by putting yourself into this state of ketosis and turning on the mTOR pathway, that it's actually anti-cancer, it's anti-diabetes. Now, I, I'm not recommending that someone do that uh, indefinitely, but I do think there's some utility to being in ketosis. So just one area where I would agree, uh, disagree with um, Dr. Clapper, although he might agree with me. I think he was talking about the paleo diet. He wasn't really talking about uh, what I did. So I've, I've tried juicing, I've been vegan, you know, and so the point is that it's a, it is a, a quest. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna have some failures. You're gonna maybe even have some setbacks. Don't let that, don't let that discourage you from pressing forward and, and uh, ultimately achieving health. We're all, you know, we're gonna sin, right? And just because we sin doesn't mean we have to quit being a Christian or whatever your religion is. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna talk some more about some actual medical information that you probably, instead of my political speech that I've given here. Does anybody have any questions or any input or any thoughts on what I've said, agree, disagree? It's called the mTOR pathway, and you can write down M-T-O-R, okay? And it means the mammalian, uh, I'd have to look, I haven't read about it a long time, uh, transfer of raptamycin. And so it had to do with an antibiotic called raptamycin. And they were doing some, some research with that. And, that, and that's when they, that, that research led to the, the uh, understanding of this pathway where the body basically can quote unquote take out the trash. So, so her question, I'm sorry, was what is, what am I talking about? What's the mTOR pathway? But it's M-T-O-R. And if you go to YouTube, you can look it up. And I, you know, I'm not trying to turn this into a ketosis um, uh, talk. I would just, Making an observation. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up because 
you know, I hear that from people all the time, talking about they're going to, you know, do this ketosis diet and all that stuff. So I'm thankful that you're bringing it up so we understand it better. There is some evidence that it can be used a certain way. It's a tool, okay? You don't always use your hammer, you know, you don't always use your wrench. You use your wrench when you need it, and you might use your wrench for a little while, but then it's time to get the hammer out. So I don't recommend being in ketosis for long periods of time. Maybe when you get the weight off that you want to get off, and then you switch over to a nutritious. There's just there's no argument in my mind against a whole food, plant-based diet. I can see Jenny Craig, and I can see Nutrisystem, and I can see Fenteramine, and I can see Contrave, and I can see all these different fads and drugs. And, and maybe they're great, maybe they're not, but I, have, I tend to believe that if I eat the food as it grew out of the ground, that God knew what he was doing, that it's not altered by man, and I, it, just, it just makes sense to me. You know? And then there's some caveats about meat, but if you look at how humans ate meat, historically, we didn't eat meat every day. We were lucky to get a meal once or twice a week, and the rest of the time we were eating a plant-based diet, plant-based diet. So again, I'm not telling anyone, don't ever eat meat again. If I tell you that, you're probably not, you're gonna just walk out of here and say, that guy's crazy. You know? I mean, I'd rather have somebody cut back on their meat than just uh, say that's impossible. Uh, and then if they want to convert completely over, good for them, you know? Uh, any other questions about what I've talked about so far? Yes? I wanted to ask, I thought you went into ketosis that it was hard on your kidneys. Well, it's not, no, I don't, I don't know that ketosis harms your kidneys. It's the protein that har harms your kidneys. So there's some evidence and it's in Dr., another great book to read. It's called How Not to Die by Dr. Uh, Greger. And he talks about how 50% of Americans by the age of 50 have lost 50% of their renal function. Half your kidneys are gone. Now, interestingly enough, we can actually live pretty well on even a fraction of one kidney. That's why people can do donate a kidney to a, a family member. But the point is, these super high protein diets damage what's called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the filtration device in your kidneys. And by storming your, your uh, glomerulus with protein, you get what's called mycoproteinuria. And the way, and the way you see that there's uh, damage is you can actually do a little pee test in your doctor's office. They'll dip a stick and they'll show microproteinuria. And then there's a blood test that shows your BU and your creatinine. Your BU and your creatinine are, are, a, are a measure of how well your kidneys are working. So I don't think it's the ketosis that's damaging, but it's the fact that you're eating the protein. So when I was doing that, I wasn't putting a lot of protein in my body. I was in ketosis because I was burning my own fat that was on my belly. Okay, So there wasn't really a lot of protein in my diet to damage my kidneys. And I got lab work and my kidneys were fine when I, when I did that. So I think if you're hammering yourself, however, with you know, uh, 200 grams of protein a day or something, I don't, depending on your body weight, that's probably uh, what's damaging people. And we just eat a lot of protein. We see a lot of animal and protein. I think the people that are doing ketosis by eating the high fat and the, and the animal protein, they are the ones that are hurting their kidneys. Yes, it's the animal protein. You know, honestly, I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on that. I'd have to review that literature and look at those studies, but that's my understanding. It's the animal protein that's the problem, not the ketosis. Any other questions? We can turn this into a question and answer session. Protein powder. So I am the worst of that. So that's really what's brought me back to Vicki here more recently. So I got to the point, and I just realized it, was, it can't be healthy, but I got to the point where, so here's the problem. So you want, to be a, you want to be healthy, okay? And you know that McDonald's is bad, okay? And I know that drinking Cokes is bad, clearly. But I drive around Seguin and what do I see? I see taco stands and McDonald's and Wendy's and man is that inconvenient because it is darn hard for me to find a decent place to eat. So I say, well, I need to start carrying my own food with me. Well, what is easier than something in a little package that will not spoil anytime soon, that I can leave in the, under the seat of my car. And the next thing I know, my, half my diet or 80% of my diet is drinking protein powder and eating protein bars. It's whey protein, so it comes from egg. Um, oh, I'm sorry, from milk. Sorry, whey, too, whey, whey comes from milk. Protein is, it's the casein protein from milk. Right, it's from milk, you're right. It's, it's from milk, not egg. Um, and, and, it, and so, um, and that's what I was, you, there's all kinds of protein, by the way. There's plant protein, you can buy plant protein as well. Uh, again, I think, I think that that's better than a Big Mac and fries, probably, but I still would put it in the same realm as processed food. It's not something that I recognize growing out of the ground. So do I think having a little bit of protein powder when you're in a pinch is certainly better than eating total garbage, but you have to watch out for falling into that trap 
of eating only that because it's so convenient, because you can carry it with you and it's easy to get access to it. And that's the, and, I, and I fell into that trap. I was eating that stuff for a long time. I was eating, and I started to calculate the amount of protein I was eating. I was eating way too much. I was probably damaging my kidneys. I didn't get blood work here recently. But anyway, I just, and I decided, hey, I'm gonna really make the effort to um, try and uh, really eat more of a whole food plant based. So in New Braunfels, I'll give them a plug. There's a place called Healthy Fresh. Yes. Anybody been there? Phenomenal place. Where is it? Healthy Fresh is by Resolute. It's in the little bank of buildings right in front of Resolute. Highly recommend it. There's another restaurant called Naturally. And I don't like Naturally as much as Healthy Fresh in terms of really, it's good. Naturally is good. Go try them both. I mean, you need some variety. That's it though. As far as I know in New Braunfels, that's your two health places. And I don't think Seguin has one at all. Um, but I would go try those places. Um, those are great. It's a great place to get a salad. According to Dr. Clapper, you ought to be getting one, maybe two big, uh, fresh, uh, natural salads a day, like, you know, living food. Go ahead. Court Street Coffee Shop has a good salad bar. Okay. They generally have black beans. Yes, they've got some egg. Yes, they've got some cheese. They you don't have, have to eat that, right? They have those, yeah. but they'll have Which one? Coffee shop has big and small as well. There you go. What's the name of the place? Court Street Coffee Shop. Court Street, Court Street Coffee Shop. And you know, and the other one I forgot about is Jason's Deli. If you go to the salad bar in Jason's Deli, you can make a very, very healthy salad. That's one of my favorite places. Yep. Jason's yep. Jason's Deli is great. And fresh. Anybody else have anything they want to ask? And I'll, I'll, start, I'll start discussing some more information. If we run out of time, I'll just quit. Yes? When you choose yeah. Steve, how much veggies do you use percentage-wise with fruit? Well, you know, um, when I was juicing, what I, when I was doing my research, I was under the impression that you first start off with about 50-50, and then as you progress, you want to, you don't want those evil carbs in your, in your diet, so you start phasing out the fruit and you go to as much green as you can, and I did that. And I, and I did lose weight that way. I'll say I did lose weight uh, when I did that. You know, um, I think when you're eating whole foods and you're eating fresh whole foods, I don't really think there's a big need for portion control, quite frankly. I mean, if you're eating the really healthy food, eat what you want. I mean, you should get, a balance, you know. I, I think if you had two servings of vegetables for every one serving of fruit, you couldn't go wrong, okay? Try to eat everything, eat the rainbow, okay? Don't just get in a rut of all I eat is kale every day and that's all I eat. Um, you need to, you need to um, try to, you know, when God made these foods for us, he put all kinds of different things in the different foods and, and they made those things available to us and so we need to take advantage of that. There's uh, phytonutrients and that, that are in the color, the, in a pepper, in uh, broccoli. Um, and of course there's the minerals you know, in many of the vegetables. That's why stews are good. You can stew and cook soups and things like that. But there, there's a lot of components. The problem is, here's the problem, is another obstacle. You can't patent broccoli. Okay, but what you can do is you can take some thing out of the broccoli and, and then take that one thing out of there and put, and put that into a supplement and then put it on the shelf at, shelf at GNC and sell it. But we don't have any clue what all the enzymes and all the things that interact in, in food in say broccoli, for, for instance, a very good cruciferous vegetable, uh, which is great for detoxifying your liver. We don't know what all's in there. And so by believing that we can pull one thing out of there we're, thinking, we're trying to outsmart God. And God knew what he was doing. He put everything in that broccoli that we need. But you can't patent broccoli. And so you can't make a billion dollars that way. But you can pull one thing out of it, alter it, mess with it, then market the heck out of it and act like it's the best thing since sliced bread. And you'll fool a bunch of people and they'll go spend money on it and, and you'll make a whole lot of money. But that's basically you know, the problem. And so eat whole foods. That's what I say. Nobody's going to make any money off that except the farmers, I guess. You know. But good. That's how it should be. Um, any other? Somebody else have a question? I will go through a few things that are important should you choose to get very serious about this and go completely whole food plant-based. So there's a few minerals that you cannot get. There's a few things that you can't get, not just minerals, that you can't get when you truly go vegan or whole food plant-based, as I prefer to call it. No beer and french fries. Um, iron. Iron is real important for children, for pregnant women or people that are uh, anemic. However, if you're a guy, you might, find, you might actually need to bleed some iron off, especially if you're taking supplemental testosterone because your testosterone's low. You'll actually get uh, high iron stores, and the, great, the best thing to, that you can measure that in what's called your CBC, your hemoglobin and hematocrit, a very common test in doctor's offices, just go give blood. 
give blood, you're helping somebody else, you're saving someone else's life, and you're pushing that iron out of your system, and you're lowering your hemoglobin and hematocrit, which might protect you from a stroke. And so, um, anyway, so men don't usually have to worry about iron. There may be some special cases where that's the uh, situation. Iron is good with vitamin C for absorption. So if you're gonna eat spinach or kale or anything green, put some citrus on it. Squeeze an orange over it or whatever citrus you like. That's gonna increase your iron absorption, greens and vitamin C. Zinc will increase its absorption when eaten with garlic and onions, okay? Um, and you should be having dark leafy greens every day. I've already mentioned uh, a little bit about cruciferous veggies. Those are things like kale, arugula, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, collards, radish. And those, uh, when you cut your broccoli, leave it on the counter. This is from Dr. Clapper. Leave it out on the counter for about 10 minutes. It gets activated by the air and increases the release of nitric oxide, NO. A nitric oxide is a substance that causes vasodilation. In fact, I forgot the guy's name, but he actually got the Nobel Prize for showing the action of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes the lining of your arterioles and your arteries called the tunica media, which is a smooth muscle layer around the vessels to dilate and increases blood flow, which increases nutrition and takes out the, the poisons and, and so forth. Cruciferous vegetables are also extremely um, useful for liver detoxification. There's two phases of, le of liver detoxification. And oftentimes what happens is phase one is really fast and phase two is a little bit slower. And so the assembly line pushes the toxins through phase one and then these toxins get stored elsewhere in the body because phase two can't keep up. And cruciferous vegetables help slow down phase one, speed up phase two. And so they go through the full detoxification process as opposed to um, getting built up in the body. And cruciferous vegetables are known to be good uh, detoxifiers for the liver. This is not really anything specific about it, so, about it, uh, but I wrote this down, and I think this is important. I don't know where to put it in, so I'll put it in now so I don't forget. But when you eat, relax. Slow down. Don't watch TV. Focus on the food. Um, chew well. You don't have to chew a thousand times, but you know, your teeth are your juicers. That's what Dr. Clapper says. And you know, the thing you have to understand is that animal protein doesn't have, animal, animal cells and, and plant cells are separated by um, a very specific sugar coat. It's not the sugar that really you can use for anything because we don't have, it's called cellulose. And plants, se plants have their skeleton in their cells. They have their skeleton around every cell. We have our skeleton in our bones. Animals have our skeleton in our bones, but that's how plants stand up erect. They don't have a spine and they don't have a leg bone or an arm bone. They have a cellulose coat around their cells, which we don't have the enzyme to break down. So if I just take a big mouthful of vegetables and swallow it and don't chew, it's just gonna pass through me. It's not, I'm not gonna get the nutrition. So it's juicing. If you have bad teeth, if you have dentures, or you're an older person and your teeth aren't working well, put it in a Vitamix, blend it up, you know? As long as you don't heat it up to like 900 degrees, it won't burn the enzymes. Just keep it cool, throw some ice in there. Keep it cool so you don't destroy the enzymes when you're heating it up in the Vitamix. But chew well, eat slow, enjoy the food, relax, meditate. So, you know, don't sit there and woof it down watching television and not you know, communing with your family members. We're, I know I've done that, especially as a surgery resident, my goodness. In fact, my dinner would be in front of a vending machine in about 10 seconds sometimes, because we had to work so hard. Iodine is a very important uh, item, especially for vegans. Iodine is in the soil, it's in the ocean, and it is needed, four molecules of iodine for every thyroxin molecule. So you need four of those per molecule, and thyroxin, um, regulate your metabolism. metabolism. That's how you get your, if you're low thyroid, you tend to be sluggish and gain weight. If you're high thyroid, really high thyroid, you tend to be skinny and have a super high um, um, metabolism. So when someone switches over hardcore vegan, this is one of the common reasons they have a failure to thrive. They'll start off on a vegan diet, I'm talking hardcore, no meat, and, and they'll find themselves starting to slow down after two or three years, like, wow, I really just don't have the energy that I used to have. It's very possible, and then one of the first things that should be checked is their thyroid, because they could be hypothyroid from lack of getting iodine. Where do you get iodine? Well, if you wanna go natural, you can get it f through sea veggies, sea vegetables. The Japanese are really good with sea vegetables. Wakami, uh, arame, dulce, and if you do that, you can take a serving three times a week, any of those, any of those, you know, those little vegetables that you see when you go to a Japanese, if you like sushi, you go to a Japanese restaurant. I guess I used to like sushi. <laughs> anyway, uh, another place to get iodine is salt. So iodized salt, uh, and you're like, oh, salt, we're supposed to away from, stay away from salt. Well, a pinch of salt isn't gonna hurt you, and it's a good way to get your iodine. It's, you know, 
don't cook with it. Just spread it on the top so you can have the taste. When you pour it into your food or you go to a restaurant and they've dumped a bag of salt in your food, there's no way to get away from it. At least when it's on the table shaker, you can control how much uh, it goes in. All you need is a pinch, a pinch, literally a pinch, and you'll have plenty of iodine. Um, you can't overdose on iodine, it's possible. Kelp can be the culprit. And there's this one called hijiki, in case you're looking at these online and they're giving you lots of choices of sea vegetables. Avoid hijiki because it tends to harbor or store arsenic, which can be uh, bad for you. A lot of people say, well, I use sea salt. Isn't that, the, isn't that the way to go? Well, sea salt, unfortunately, the way it's produced, the iodine actually evaporates out of it because uh, uh, iodine, just like chlorine, it's like when you go to a swimming pool, you're smelling the chlorine in the pool, is a halogen. And it's very, um, it's very volatile, and, it, and when it sits out in the sun, you, sea salt basically is, de, is devoid of iodine. You're not going to get any iodine if you use sea salt, so unfortunately. Um, another thing that uh, is important, my, or one, another way I should say that you can get some of these um, components is using a multivitamin. And I remember multivitamins were the rage, remember, 20 years ago, or, or, and they still are, I guess, to a lot of people. Centrum and Geritol and you know whatever, all these different multivitamins. Well, unfortunately, there are some pitfalls to multivitamins. And this is, again, in Dr. Clapper's talk, if you want to hear a more detailed explanation. But beta carotene, so, any, so there's four vitamins that are fat soluble. They're, the way I remembered it in med school was ADEC, A, D, E, and K, okay? So if, you, if you're taking the other ones that are water soluble, if you eat too much, you just pee them out. No big deal, as long as your kidneys are working. You just pee them out or you they go out the other way, however they get out, however the body deals with that particular, um, uh, the metabolism for that particular vitamin. But A, D, E, and K, you can overdose on because your body will store it in the fat. It's not water soluble, it can be built up in your fat. So beta carotene, which is like a form of vitamin A, is fat soluble and it can be uh, built up. And now there's studies showing that people who are taking these multivitamins with massive doses, 30,000 international units of beta carotene, are stimulating cancer growth. And, they're, and it's now proven. I mean, this isn't question, this, isn't, this is something that's shown in the literature. Vitamin A, which is also a fat soluble vitamin, it doesn't get peed out, it gets stored in your fat, is associated with the increase in hip fracture. So you think you're doing a good thing by taking all that vitamin A. We're not talking about the vitamin A from eating a carrot. I'm talking about the vitamin A from taking a multivitamin, which has way too much uh, in there. Folic acid, high dose folic acid, has been associated with breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. Not to be confused with folate, which is what you find in vegetables. That's, the, that's what the, it's in green vegetables. You can eat all the folate you want. But you want to avoid multivitamins with, uh, with really any folic acid in them whatsoever. Now there may be a difference there for pregnant women because of neural tube defects, um, but there may be a way to get a folate uh, um, there, I don't know if you can just get folate as a supplement, but I mean, you can also just eat green vegetables. But if you're not pregnant, I mean, I, I would imagine you'll be okay if you take folic acid for the nine months that you're pregnant to protect your child from a neural tube defect. So I certainly don't want someone to fall into that trap. But generally speaking, you don't want folic acid. Uh, it is not good for you. So you can get multivitamins that don't have um, beta carotene, vitamin A, or folic acid. Just look on the back, look on the bottle. They're out there. You want to get about 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, about 200 micrograms of B12 a day, 150 micrograms of iodine a day, or you can do about 500 to 1,000 a week. You can just take it once a week if you want. But you want to find a multivitamin if you're going to take one without the folic acid, the vitamin A, and the beta carotene. So what I'm saying here, in case I've put you all to sleep, is that you don't need to buy expensive supplements from GNC. You don't need to take 50 pills a day to get what you need. You can get everything you need by eating a whole food plant-based diet. The nutrition's there, all, everything you need is in that food, uh, but the things as a vegan, as a person not eating meat, and really, and even if you're a meat eater, by the way, they're also deficient. Everyone's deficient in vitamin D these days. It's just, it's almost impossible not to be. Um, it just has to do with the way we live, <clears throat> the way we work. Um, B12, and B12, by the way, isn't made by animals. They get it from microbes in the soil. So they eat the dirty vegetables because they don't wash their vegetables, and those microbes get into their gut and they actually produce vitamin B12. We have chlorine in our water, we sanitize our vegetables, and so those microbes are gone. Otherwise, back in the day, when we ate stuff out, out of the ground, we didn't have to worry about B12 either. But now we do because I mean, we don't want to get, you know, uh, uh, some sort of horrible GI bug from eating contaminated water. So I'm not saying go drink out of a dirty stream, <laughs> but uh, just take your B12 through uh, appropriate multivitamin. And B12 is extremely, so we've talked about B12 a little bit, it's important for brain and spinal cord, um, very important. Um, again, I talked about the microbes in the soil, it's not made by animals, 
Um, I'm pretty much I'm repeating myself. There is something called pseudo vitamin B12. And so when you are eating sea vegetables, spirulina, which everyone thinks is so healthy, or blue-green algae, you don't want to eat it on the same day that you're taking, if you're going to take your B12 supplement, say once a week, you want to eat those on a different day. So what that is called in chemistry is a competitive antagonist. And so there's a receptor that accepts B12, and now it, and it helps the brain and spinal cord. And then there's this thing called pseudo B12, which looks just like it in a lot of ways, but it's not B12. It doesn't help the brain and spinal cord, but it's able to bind to the receptor and keep the good B12 from having a home, from having that place to sit. And so when you're eating sea vegetables, all the ones like wakame and dulce and all the ones I talked about earlier, those do contain a pretty significant level of pseudo B12. And so you, when you're, if you took your B12 supplement and you wash it down with some sea vegetables, Japanese sea vegetables, you're not gonna get the benefit of that B12 because the uh, pseudo B12 that's in those sea vegetables or spirulina or blue-green algae is gonna compete and, uh, for those sites and make it impossible for the good B12, the ones that's good for your brain and your spinal cord to, to, um, to bind. Does anybody have any questions? Is this interesting or am I just putting you all to sleep with this information? Okay. I'm like fascinated. Okay, all right. All right. Does anybody have any questions at this point about what I've said? How much B12 did you say? 200 micrograms. And you know, we can maybe make a flyer for this or something or we're gonna help you. Um, I don't know if you have an email list for all these people or how that works, but. I, I do not have yeah. an email list for all, all these people, but um, if y'all wanna start one, we can do that. So you could do 150 a day or if you want to keep it simple, you could take a good multivitamin that doesn't have those bad, the bad stuff in there I was talking about. Um, or you could take about 1,000 a week. You could just take it one time a week. You could take your B12 one time a week. You can take it every day. But you should at least take it once a week. Don't take it once a year. Uh, once a week would be the biggest, I would spread it. It is a water-soluble um, vitamin. So you're not going to overdose on methylcobalamin, which is B12. So essential fatty acids. It's methyl... Oh, it's methylcobalamin, or is it methyl? The other one is cyanobalamin. Yes, that's correct. Yes, the one I had written down was methyl. Yeah, and there's also cyanocobalamin. They're both forms of B12. They're both fine, either one. Um, I don't own the methylcobalamin factory, so. Uh, essential fatty acids. So, you know, just like we know there's essential amino acids, and that, those are just amino acids that we can't, our body can't produce. And by the way, you know, Let's talk about the million dollar question, the one I always hear from doctors, by the way. And when I tell them that I'm drinking green smoothies made of kale and fruit, they, or, or whatever I mean, they'll say, well, where do you get your protein? Where do you get your protein? I'm like, you went to med school? <laughs> so animals don't make it either. The amino acids come from the plants that the cows eat. Cows don't eat cows, you know, they don't eat meat. So they get their, they get their amino acids from the plants just like we can get our amino acids from the plants. So, um, and there's essential fatty acids. So fatty acids are the same way. And linoleic acid's the good one. Linoleic acid gets converted in our body to something called EPA and ultimately to something called DHA. Okay, and DHA is, um, is extremely important and vegans do have a pretty difficult time getting, and this is, you know, this is what goes into neurotransmitters and things that make your brain and your body work properly. Vegans do have a hard time getting enough DHA. And this system that turns linoleic acid down to DHA is only 10% efficient, okay? So it only works 10% efficient to begin with. But when you go pile down some nasty omega-6s, the omega-6, omega-3 good, omega-6 bad, when you pound down some McDonald's french fries or some peanut oil or some sort of low quality oil, you now decrease because they use the same enzyme. Omega-6 uses the same enzyme as omega to make omega-3, but omega-6 doesn't make anything good with it. They make garbage with it. So now you've taken your resources, your enzymes that convert to DHA and use them for something that's not really in your best interest. And so by eating the junk oils like McDonald's french fries, you now decreased your ability to make DHA down to 2%. You were 10%, now you're 2%. So by eating a lot of those junk oils, you're blocking, that's why they say the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6 should be a certain ratio. They don't want you to eat too much omega-6 because then your body can't make DHA. And DHA is, um, is extremely important. So what's the, what's the solution? I'm telling you all the problems. Eat dark and green, eat eight to 10 walnuts a day, Hemp seed, flax seed, these are all great ways. And, and, and avoid omega-6s, the junk food, the peanut oil. Um, if then you still have a problem, then you can take 150 to 300 milligrams of DHA EPA for about 90 days. And then after that, you can probably go to every other day or most days in a month. And it's algae derived. Remember, it comes from the algae. The fish, when they say eat fish oil, the fish 
don't create these, don't create omega-3s. The fish are getting it from the algae that they're eating. They're eating the plants, it's going into the fish, and then we're eating the fish. So they say, oh, fish oil is a great source of, of these omegas, omega-3. Well, the fish get it from the algae. Just eat the algae, you know, or, or get the, the, the supplement that's made from, so that's a good supplement. I'm naming supplements now that really are ones that you might want to consider. Stay away from taking 10,000 supplements a day, but if you think you need some DHA, uh, then, then that's uh, what, you might want to, what you might want to consider. Um, what else? Yes, yes, and uh, you know I don't know what lab it is, but it's in Clapper's video, and he talks about it. And there is a test. There's a test. You can actually even test your amino acids too. So you can test to see whether you're. So if someone's like, oh my God, I've been eating kale so long, and I just I'm convinced that I'm not getting enough protein. There's an actual test you can take to see if that's really true or not. Whether you're you already getting enough protein in your diet or not. It's probably not. If you're eating enough legumes and beans and lentils, yeah, you're you're, 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 you're probably just fine. Uh, not too many vegans end up with a protein deficiency, but I'm sure anything is possible. Talk a little bit about exercise. Uh, exercise, you should try to get your heart rate above 100 beats per minute, three times a week. 20 minutes is good, 40 minutes is better. I'd say that's the minimum that I would, I would do. I mean, just get, put some hand weights in your hands or walk around the block. You gotta get out there and get some exercise. That's how your body pr takes out the trash as well. Exercise helps your body rev up your body's metabolism and the blood flows and cleans everything out and cleans out all those stagnant areas and, and allows your body to, to, to quote unquote take out the trash. So if you're gonna go get some labs, get some basic labs. If you really feel like you, you know, if you're on this diet and you're really worried that this is gonna cause a problem for you, CBC is a blood test that would help you figure out whether you have an iron deficiency. A metabolic profile, would help you figure out whether you're hurting your liver or your kidneys. Uh, a thyroid panel would help you determine whether you have enough iodine in your, in your uh, diet. And you can even have a test to see if you have enough vitamin B12. There's certain markers, one's called MMA and the other one's called homocysteine. And if your B12's low, those will actually raise up. And then of course, the one I really recommend is getting your vitamin D checked. I bet everyone in this room, unless they're supplementing with a quality supplement, uh, would be surprised to see how low their vitamin D levels are. I know mine was super low whenever I had it checked, and I considered myself to be a pretty healthy eater and very active. Um, <clears throat> I'll skip that. I'll skip that because I know I've talked a lot longer than... Uh... So here, this is, this is worth mentioning. The USDA, and I should have put this in my obstacles, I, I, got, I got on the wrong sheet, but the USDA makes our nutritional guidelines. That's the people who regulate the industry, basically. I mean, shouldn't like the National Health Institute or somebody like that be making our health guidelines? That's like the fox in the hen house. So the people who are affected by the lobby money that comes from all these ag agricultural uh, farms are the ones making the rules to say what we should eat and what's healthy. They're not doctors, last time I checked. So it's very interesting that the USDA makes those guidelines. That doesn't make any sense to me. It, uh, it, sm it smells. So. Um, humans are not carnivores. So people think they're carnivores, and this was very interesting, and this is in Clapper's video, I found this very interesting. So when you look at our parotid glands, they actually have an, uh, an, an enzyme that dissolves starches. It doesn't dissolve meat. Cats actually have enzymes in their glands, in their mouth, that, that digest meat. Humans do not. Um, our metabolism favors glucose. So there's a whole thing we had to learn in medical school about the mitochondria and about the Krebs cycle and about the glucose metabolism. You know, and we learned a little bit about fat metabolism, but really only from the standpoint of being in ketosis. That's not our primary way of metabolizing. If we're meant to eat meat, then we would have been primary ketotic metabolizers. We're not. Our body primarily uses glucose as a fuel. If you look at our digestive systems, uh, they're very long. So animals who are meant to eat meat typically have much shorter digestive systems, and they can spit that meat out pretty quickly through that short intestine, intestinal tract and, and, and colon and so forth. That's why we have such a high rate of colon cancer because we're not meant to have meat rotting in our colon and our digestive tracts are so long, when you eat meat three times a day, you've packed it up with all this meat and it's simply not meant uh, to be that way. And, uh, and that's why we end up with a higher rate of colon cancer. And I, and I think I will have a more specific reason. I will go ahead and go over that now since it's relevant and I'll skip it down here. So when you eat meat, your body, you're, you have bacteria you're, so if you were to take what's called your biome, your gut biome, you were to you're poop in a cup and send it off to a laboratory, they could literally pretty much tell you what your diet is based on what bacteria live in your gut. When you eat primarily vegetables, when you have a whole food plant-based diet versus someone who eats just about only meat or primarily meat, the bacteria in the gut are completely different. 
They're completely different. This is, in fact, there's this whole science now that we're not going to get into, but there's a great thing on Netflix called uh, The Gut is Your Second Brain. It's super interesting. I highly recommend checking that out. But there's things we are now learning about our gut and the bacteria in our gut that are actually mind-blowing. But the point is that our guts were designed to, to, um, uh, to digest plant material, not... not, uh, not uh, meat. So certainly we're omnivores. I'm not going to say we're not omnivores, but I think we were intended to eat meat once or twice a month maybe. Certainly not the way we do every meal and certainly not meat. That we, I didn't even get into this topic of how the meat we eat is tainted with hormones and antibiotics and GMO you know, corn and all this, you know, those animals are tortured. And that's not the subject of this talk, but, but um, we, uh, we really are, we're certainly not designed to eat poisonous meat, that's for sure. Um, we already talked a little bit about paleo and ketosis, so I'm actually going to skip that. Uh, but I will mention something called TMA, and this is important. And you asked me about TMA. So TMA comes, what happens is, from meat, you get byproducts called carnitine. And there was this thing we learned in biochemistry called the carnitine shuttle. It was an energy shuttle to shuttle ATP in and out of the mitochondria. And then choline um, goes to make different uh, components in the cell. Anyway, it, that doesn't matter. But the, bac the bacteria that like these things the, it will proliferate. If you eat a lot of meat, the bacteria that like carnitine and choline will be the bacteria that live in your gut. If you put out cat food, you get more cats. If you put out, uh, I don't know, uh, dog food, I guess you get more dogs. You know, anyway, the point is you're feeding to attract certain bacteria. Uh, uh, Peptostreptococcus and Clostridia are usually the ones that will what that will be attracted to carnitine and choline. And you become, you have the bacterial signature, the bacterial um, um, animals, if you will, living in your gut of a meat eater. These guys will then convert that carnitine and that choline into something called trimethylamine. Okay, what's that? Well, trimethylamine is just a component, a component of that metabolism, and then your liver gets a hold of that trimethylamine because your liver is basically the filter for your body. It tries to convert bad stuff by either oxidizing it or reducing it or breaking it down into a complete, from a fat-soluble substance to a water-soluble substance so it can be excreted in the urine, whatever. The liver is amazing, actually. It does a lot of stuff. But liver takes TMA and it oxidizes it, and it creates trimethylamine, trimethylamine oxide, and that uh, molecule drives cholesterol into arterial walls. And so there's even now a recent study um, that, that we talked about that um, shows the incidence of coronary artery disease and, and heart attack is higher in people who are eating meat because they're getting this trimethylamine driving the, the cholesterol plaques in their body. Anyway, it's bad stuff. And you simply get it by eating meat. It doesn't matter whether it's grass-fed or whether it's you know, uh, uh, made the conventional way. Uh, TMA is TMA. Animal flesh, whether it's fish, it's chicken, or it's beef, um, attracts the type of bacteria that produce this substance. It's pretty significant. Anybody have a question? Isn't that, uh, like, TMAO, isn't that like a cancer promoter also? Yes, it's also shown to be a cancer promoter. I don't, I don't remember that study. I, I reviewed the study just recently on the, on the, I, carter, yeah, on the corner. I've been reading about it, and I just remember, because yeah, I told you that this afternoon, so there are people who believe that the bologna and the hot dogs and the junk meat that kids eat is as bad as smoking cigarettes in terms of causing cancer, GI cancer. So it's pretty ironic. You know, I had this argument with my nanny, who's completely converted over to vegan now, and she cooks vegan. So sorry, Donna, if you end up watching this, I'm not throwing you under the bus. But um, you know, whenever I was sort of pushing my family and my kids to join in on this vegan thing. I said, well, why don't we give them a pack of Marlboros to go with their hot dogs? You know, why don't we, why don't we let them smoke? I mean, you know, if I were to do that, you'd call CPS, right? If I were to give my kids a pack of cigarettes, you'd call CPS on me and say, smoke away. But when I give them a, a plate full of processed crumb, cruddy meat, deli meat, and hot dogs, and salami, and bologna, and all that stuff, nobody has anything to say about that. And I'm giving them the same likelihood of getting cancer, colon cancer in this case, as I would if I gave them cigarettes to, for lung cancer. And it's pretty crazy if you ask People me. Be saying, hey, you're Right, 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 right. So, you are. did you have a question? Uh, to Murray, what do you think about it? I love it. I love it. So, if you tasted the the lentil, sweet potato, coconut curry stuff that I brought in the big the big aluminum deal, did you like that? It was good. That's vegan. That's vegan. That's good. Yeah. 
I love Indian spices. So there's been over 13,000 studies done on turmeric. Um, you, well, you get me, I could talk for three hours about turmeric. You shouldn't even brought that up, but that's my, that's my favorite. So turmeric is phenomenal. Turmeric has been shown to be anti-cancer, anti-diabetes, anti-inflammation, anti-arthritis, um, and it has no side effects. You can, there's some turmeric uh, preparations that, and there's some studies that have shown that turmeric in certain doses is just as effective as Advil for inflammation, for a headache or for an achy knee or an achy joint. I, you can buy pills. You can go to HEB and they'll sell you turmeric pills. That's fine. I prefer to cook with turmeric and here's how I cook with it. I use coconut oil. Uh, use whatever oil you want. Try to use something relatively healthy. I use coconut oil. To the, the, what, the substance in turmeric that is active is called curcumin. Okay, not to be confused with cumin seeds. Curcuma it's longa? curcumin, yeah. Curcuma longa? Uh, you know, maybe, you may know more than I do about turmeric. So I call it curcumin, that's what I've read. They talk about curcumin. But curcumin is fat soluble. So we talked about water soluble versus fat soluble. So you gotta have something in there that's fat, and I use coconut oil. Otherwise you're not gonna suck the curcumin into an active state. The other thing you can do is you can put black pepper. So you're, I cook, I'll cook vegetables for my kids. Coconut oil, I'll drop some turmeric in there. I'll drop some black pepper on that, not too much because the kids don't want it too spicy. But that black pepper makes the curcumin a thousand times more bioavailable to your body. And it does that actually not because it does anything to the curcumin. It revs your liver up. It revs up a pathway in your liver that then a lot, it keeps the curcumin from being broken down as quickly. So you'll see a lot of people make preparations of, of curcumin pills for inflammation and they'll contain ginger, curcumin, um, and uh, in fact a friend of mine who's a holistic doctor who lives in another state, his name's Sunil Pai, he wrote the book Inflammation Nation. Um, uh, has a product called Bosmeric, and it's pretty phenomenal. I had some, I had some SI pain from doing some lunges at the gym when I was at this big, I gave a talk uh, a while back in Dallas uh, on, at a holistic conference. And, uh, and I took this thing and in 20 minutes the pain was gone. So it's pretty, it pretty impressive, but I think you can also get some of the same effects by just cooking it uh, yourself. I like to cook it in my food because it tastes great, but it does have phenomenal health benefits. I can't, if there's one spice you're gonna use, that's it, turmeric, that's the one. If you're just not gonna use anything else, that would be the one, that with black pepper and coconut oil. Yeah. And for inflammation, would it do more good to take it regularly as a supplement if you're not going to be Absolutely, it, it has no side effects. Yeah. So you take too much Advil, you get a big ulcer in your stomach and your kidneys shut down. You can't overdose on turmeric. I've never heard of anybody overdosing on turmeric. I mean, you might get a tummy ache, you know, but you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna have a bleeding ulcer from your stomach from, from taking turmeric. It isn't gonna work for everybody, probably. I mean, just like, neither does Advil. Nothing, there's, I don't know any medicine that works for everybody, but it works for a lot of people and it's good stuff. Um, so that's, yeah, good question. Love turmeric, uh, my favorite. My favorite thing to cook with. I was, only had one spice I was allowed to use, uh, then I, that'd be it. So one more, we'll go over a couple more other things. Endotoxin. So endotoxin is a protein that lives within the bacteria of meat. And there was a study that was done, if you read Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die, they did a study and they, they looked at people who were cooking chicken in their kitchen. And what they found, that, that they, were, they found that when they took this chicken and they cooked it, that there was bacteria everywhere. There was bacteria, I mean, these things are covered with bacteria, just absolutely saturated with it. I said, wow, that's disgusting. It was, all over the, it was all over the counter, it was all over the person's hands, it was everywhere. And so they said, okay, we're gonna now have them um, um, handle the chicken the way we would in a, in, a, in a standardized manner, in a scientific manner. In other words, you wear some gloves and you only put it on this one spot, and you, know, you take some precautions. And they found that there was still a huge load of bacteria. You can't get rid of it. So they said, wow, that's crazy. So now they had them scrub down the whole damn kitchen with bleach oh. after, they, after they handled the chicken. And they, there were still bacteria. You cannot get away from the bacteria that is on this meat. You can't escape it. It's everywhere. You know, you say, oh, I, I'm going to use a separate cutting board. I have my vegetable cutting board and my meat cutting board. No, it doesn't work. The bacteria gets everywhere. So what can happen is you can have this endotoxin. And here's why it's bad. It causes inflammation. It causes a lot of inflammation. Uh, it affects a lot of the factors in your body. But it's heat resistant. So when you cook the meat, it doesn't kill the endotoxin. The endotoxin's still there. It's heat resistant. You can't, by, heat, by cooking the food, it doesn't go away. And not only does it cause inflammation, but it causes something called leaky gut syndrome, which we hear that word thrown around a lot, but it basically punches holes in your gut so that the things that are in your food that you ate that your body normally wouldn't absorb into your bloodstream get absorbed into your bloodstream. So I don't know if you got some toxic chemical in there. Now the toxic chemical can hop, hop right around the, hop right across that little breach in your gut 
and, uh, and, and, and poison you. So um, leaky gut's a real thing. And, uh, and a lot of the foods we eat you know, can cause leaky gut. But anyway, so that's it's something that is um, unique to meat. You know, you're not gonna get endotoxin unless it comes from that bacteria and it's uh, on, on meat. There's also a new one, I don't know much about it, but I read about it, it's relatively new. It's called new NEU, if you write it down, NEU 5GC, and it's only in animal flesh. And it's been associated with coronary artery disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammation. Google that one, I, I, don't, I can't tell you much more about it. It was just, um, yeah, it's NEU new 5GC, like Charlie. And uh, it's just, it's, you know, we're gonna probably learn all kinds of things as time goes on that we didn't even realize was, was in this stuff. So um, a lot of people believe that sugar, we'll just go one more, we'll talk about one more thing and then we'll be done, and that's diabetes. And so when someone has a lot of fat, you know, we all know that a lot of people are under, under the impression that when someone gets really heavy, they get overweight, they tend to develop type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is the kind that we have to take pills. Type one diabetes is when you usually have it as a child. It's because your, what's called your islets of Langerhans, your, your pancreatic cells that produce insulin um, are attacked by your own immune system is what we believe happens. And you can no longer produce insulin that way. But in a person who's overweight, they produce insulin just fine. But what happens is they get what's called intramyocellular lipids. The fat gets inside the cell and the receptors that allow sugar to pass from the bloodstream into the cell are basically affected, they're blocked. And so you effectively can't move the sugar. When you eat sugar, um, or you eat glucose, you eat a banana or whatever, what ultimately happens is your body takes that sugar and it goes into your muscle tissue. It goes into your muscle tissue, it also goes into your liver and it's formed as a sugar called glycogen. And so glycogen is, that's, that's how we store sugar. That's the only way we can store sugar, by the way, is it goes in, into your muscle cells or into your liver and is stored as glycogen. But when these cell, when someone becomes really fat, they start to um, accumulate this fat, fatty uh, intramy intramyocellular lipids, these fat, globules inside their cells that prevent them from getting sugar across the membrane. And that's the cause of type 2 diabetes. So, um, and that's it. That's, uh, that's all, those are pretty much uh, all the things I had to talk about. I also had a handout from a friend of mine who lives in Houston and she is constantly cooking. Her name's Bobby Briggs. So if I end up putting this on YouTube, uh, thank you, Bobby, for providing the audience with this handout. And she goes through some of the challenges in terms of what do I substitute for what? What do I do? And this is just a real practical two-page uh, handout where she talks about what she uses in her cooking um, to get away from animal protein and to, to, to have delicious food that is cooked with non-animal uh, protein ingredients um, that is, uh, she says, easy to cook. So, All right, does anybody have any other any questions? Yes. I don't. Um, it was in Clapper's talk. He actually showed, uh, I think, a two or three of them. You know, you can pick it out on your own. Uh, you just want to try to avoid those components that I was referring to earlier. Um, the beta carotene, the vitamin A, and the folic acid. Folate's fine, folic acid. I'll tell you what, if I, I'll get that to Vicki. I'll find what it is, and you could put it on your Facebook page. A good she wants to know what's a good multivitamin. I think a multivitamin is a good idea. If you're going to be a vegan, you need to, you need to make sure you're getting your iodine, your vitamin D, and, uh, and uh, B12, and all the other things that we talked about, magnesium, zinc. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, Dr. Furman has a, has a good multivitamin. Yes. Furman's, that, when I looked at Clapper's video, that was the one in the middle. I can't remember what it's called. It was Dr. Furman. There you go. And, that, and it was, it's the middle one on his video. He had three multivitamins. Yeah, so Furman had a, a multivitamin that meets the criterion of Dr. Clapper, uh, who's a... Uh, yes? I'm sorry? Swanson vitamins. Swanson vitamins. Okay, yeah. If anybody knows, speak up. You guys know better than me. I'm obviously not taking a multivitamin. I need to, right? Practice what I preach. Yeah? If you brine the chicken, would that still have bacteria? If you what? If you brine the chicken. You know, I'm careful not to make things up. So I want to make sure that anything I talk about, I've seen in a study or have some scientific basis for it. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not sure. Brine is where you put salt or sugar and ice. Is that what you're talking about? Where you soak the... Yeah. My guess is no. Um, you're still going to get the endotoxin even if you kill the bacteria. But I do not know the answer to that question. We can Google it. Hopefully it will make sense. It won't be some fake news, right? So uh, anybody else have any questions? Where's your handout? 
over there on the corner of the table. And we'll get and I'll I'll email it to Vicky if you want to yeah, post it or I yeah. Email it to anybody if, if, if there's not enough to pass out. So I took a lot longer, I think, than I expected. I was going to go back there, and I wanted people who made that food to come and talk about it. But we'll save that for another night, because we ended up talking a little bit longer than I had planned. And I'm sure people are probably ready to get out of here. Oh, Anybody else? Yeah. I learned so much. Thank well, good. Can we get your recipe? It's, go take a picture of it. it it's sitting right there in the front. You had to snap a picture of it. I, I put it up. It's good stuff, huh? They like it, Donna. They liked your, uh, they liked your lentils. Anybody else have a question? We good? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed yeah. it. Everybody should be as lucky as I am to have you in the doctor. Very good. I liked your stool. Yourself, or you have a bad back, that's who you need to go see. <laughs>